Hi, so I'm a designer and researcher, and um, I use CGI or 3D software in my practice as a way to investigate images. So for me, the act of construction is a deconstruction. And so what I want to talk about today um, is specifically resolution, how it's used in the production of um, evidence. So 3D animations that will be used in court um, that want to be um, passed as evidence. Sometimes this is successful, sometimes this is not. And specifically the intentional, sometimes bad or really selective resolution in these videos and what this means in terms of trying to pass them as a, as a piece of accountability. So, yeah, since we don't have so much time, I'll just go through like a really rough, um, more or less time frame of some of these animations. Um, one of the, I think, quotes that keeps on coming back um, for myself in this sort of work is from 1999, um, a time where I think technologies like these were still, for a general public, much more sort of in a dream world. Something that was, you know, made by Pixar, big studios, huge render engines, but nothing um, that was attainable for a general public. Um, so this quote goes, for Hollywood, it is special effects for covert operators in the U.S. military and intelligence agencies. It is a weapon of the future. Once you can take any kind of information and reduce it into ones and zeros, you can do some pretty interesting things. So for me, one of the important parts of this um, quote is really this reduction to ones and zeros. This idea by somehow translating a physical world into binaries, you create something that you can twist and bend into a different narrative. Um, part of, of me trying to understand histories of 3D and CG technology is looking into the 1500s. So the beginning of um, Renaissance, um, where there was a strive towards understanding, for one, also perspective drawings, so an idea of measuring the real world and through that sort of flattening the earth. So that there is an idea of, of an accurate measurement and, and if the measurement is right, then the image will also portray reality. Um, and so what we're looking at here are images by a um, person called Erhard Schön, who was a disciple of um, Albrecht Dürer. And his works for me are really interesting because not only does he focus on perspective drawing, he includes a human figure. And the way he does this is by enmeshing um, the same figure, so it's a, it's a multiplication of, of the same character, in sort of geometric solids um, with the idea that now you can sort of um, scale and position the figure at will. So, so by sort of reducing it into a low resolution, you gain a control over the character itself. And at the same time, they look really um, contemporary. They don't look like something from 1538. Um, from, from here, we go quickly to a movie called um, The Rendezvous in Montreal from 1987. And this one is more or less significant in, the, in this timeline because it was the, the first time where it was attempted to recreate characters synthetically that were quite well known. So this is Humphrey Bogart. And in this video, um, there is Marilyn Monroe and Humphrey Bogart meeting and going on a date. So something that didn't actually happen in real. Um, and, and what the, the researchers were trying to do is to try and figure out um, how far can we take this, um, this synthetic recreation and also the myth within this recreation. And for this, they've created this um, computer uh, software, which they call Human Factory, which is a very good name. Um, where they sort of take the human into its parts. So you see skin and hair creation is like its own sort of department within um, the resulting animation. So uh, within this flowchart, you see sort of all of the bits and pieces that are needed to then create the final piece. Um, and so here going to, to some of the th three examples um, of actual 3D animations used for evidence. It's also important to note that these animations are all from the US. Um, specifically because the court system works differently, so you'd have a jury, so there's a different, um, in, not intention, but, but there's a different relationship in terms of storytelling um, and evidence production, there being a jury than you'd have in, in European courts, for example. Um, so this quote here I'll read is, a computer simulation of an accident consists of a set of commands processed by a computer which mathematically describe a model of the actual accident. A large number of parameters defining the accident should be included in the model to ensure the model accurately reflects reality. Um, so this is by Barry Sullivan, um, sort of writing in a law journal about uh, 
you know, what sort of describing to lawyers what um, the effect is of a um, of a computer animation. And I think what's what's super interesting in this is sort of that he's saying a large number of pattern meters, but nowhere is described how these are captured and how these are processed. So it's clear that there should somehow be a capture mechanism, so a scanning or a measuring, um, to then recreate this into computer, but the tools aren't necessarily assessed. And what we're looking at here is an animation from 1992. Um, this was the first one that was used in a, in a high profile criminal court, and also the first one that was used in a murder case. So before, animations would be used for pattern infringement cases or, um, I don't know, car accidents, things like that, where it was much more a physics calculation rather than once um, the human figure got introduced, it got, it got much more. Um, of course, with, wit with witness accounts, it became much more a narrative where you'd show several versions of the same account to show, hey, witness one said this, witness two says this, how do these look compared to each other? And then here in 2002, already these, these sort of uh, trajectories you see going through the figure, they're always used to show a bullet trajectory. So to then place the figure within the recreated um, 3D space and try to figure out where was the figure at the time that the crime took place. And already here, uh, the, the render quality is very different from before. So this one was quite an emotional trial where um, a retired policeman um, was accused of shooting his wife. And the big part of the, of the case was that she was already in her pajamas. So I think it's quite interesting sort of what was chosen to be rendered. So her in pajamas was an important part. So she's not a stick figure, she's a, she's a human being with hair. But you know, in terms of render time, that takes much more time to render. And these things have to be done in a really quick turnaround, like in a, in a week's turnaround to then also be able to be seen at the trial. So there's an explicit choice in what is shown, in which way and in, at what detail. And so now the, the most prominent case of um, the, the use of 3D animations, and it's also important to note that in this case, um, this animation that we'll see was not passed as a piece of evidence, but it was allowed to be screened in court. So that is a huge difference at the same time. I think it being a visual presence in a court is also quite, makes quite an impact. And what we're looking at is the trial of George Zimmerman um, sort of trying to prove that he acted in self-defense shooting Trayvon Martin in uh, 2012 in Florida. And what's also incredibly different from this video is for one, of course, the, the racial implications, and two, the technology that was used. And through the, the high profile of this case, there were several versions of 3D renders. So the one we're looking at here was made by Contrast Forensics, and it was commissioned by the defense lawyer to um, back up George Zimmerman's claim. And what we're looking at here is made by News Direct. So that's an agency out of Taiwan that's owned by Reuters. And they create um, news clips about stories that don't have any visual material. So if a news agency wants to broadcast this story, then they need some sort of visual material to talk over. And then, so they have this incredible fast turnaround of producing these videos. And so for me, this became an interesting moment of then comparing these very different ways of production, right? In one, you have a grass texture that clearly has been mirrored a bunch of times, and the other one, it's green. So again, like the hoodie, similar to the pajama, was a really important artifact in the trial. So they took the time to, to model the hoodie. Um, but then the grass or the rain, you know, they all play a certain part in these videos um, and are an important factor in the rendering time. Um, so to, to conclude, what was, um, and, and bring it back to the photorealism that isn't apparent in the, in the final film. What was important in this video is that for the first time motion capture was used um, to recreate the film. What we're looking at here is um, the motion capture suit that was used from a company called Exens at a game con and also at the police academy in Appeldoorn in the Netherlands. Um, and so the, the interesting thing is that they were trying to say that this motion capture suit is a new way of capturing data. Um, and because it is, it supports the accuracy of the video. But then within sort of a two hour testimony of the animator talking about how the motion capture suit works, 
he essentially is saying that, yes, it is only 16 sensors in space. Like, the computer doesn't know that it's a body. And yes, it was me wearing it, impersonating Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. So then again, it's like, what accuracy is it? Is it the accuracy of the animator impersonating these people, right? But it isn't necessarily... Uh, so it's accurate in terms of his recreation, but it isn't accurate in terms of what has actually happened. So it's still a witness account that is more or less rendered, but it, it's not someone filming the, the events. And at the same time, I went to go talk to the producers of this uh, motion capture suit, Accents, in Enschede, in the Netherlands. And they're saying, well, it's actually really great that these trackers are not, you know, sort of attached to any body. You can attach them to the body, but you can also just do really crazy stuff with them. And you can sort of have one tracker in one hand, and another one, another person can have one of these trackers. And on the computer, sort of, this is what it'll look like, right? It looks as if... Maybe two people together are one body, but actually it's just 16 trackers that then simulate that this is a body. And also significant in this picture, of course, is sort of the, the transposition of race and gender um, that can appear, but that isn't necessarily obvious within the, the software itself. So, thank you.